Let's talk about science and art. Science and art often seem to exist in separate domains. They can appear like polar opposites, one fact-driven and data-driven, the other driven by human emotions. Science dominated by technical introverts and art by expressive eccentrics. But is this really true? Today, many thinkers are inspired by both art and science. For those of us who practice both, we know that the similarities between how artists and scientists work outweigh the differences. Art and science both are dedicated to asking the central questions placed before us, like, where do we come from? What are we? And how does the world around us work? Where are we going? What is our destiny? Science and art force us to reassess our place in the world. From the smallest length scale of subatomic particles to the inconceivable size of the whole cosmos. Art and science, they want to find the truth, understand why it matters, and how it can impact our lives and move our society forward. Well, both search deeply for these answers. But sometimes the quest for the answers is not a straight line. They can follow a winding course of failure and frustration. And as a matter of fact, this is the more common route, as many examples in history and my personal experience tells. Nevertheless, the desire to conduct art and science is deeply engraved in our human DNA. We keep pushing forward, looking for answers. The artist's studio and the scientist's laboratory are the two places that are reserved for this open-ended exploration, where failure is a welcome part of the process. Progress and learning transpires by continuous feedback between thinking, acting, and observing. Personally, it took me some time and an unexpected coincidence to see and the connections between art and science that I have just discussed. A few years ago, the seemingly clear connection between science and art was not so obvious to me. Actually, I was convinced that art and science live in two different domains with separate goals that are very divergent, conducted by entirely different people. So, let me explain how I personally was able to connect these worlds. I was trained as a physicist. My main expertise lies in the area of high-resolution microscopy, with the aim to explore materials at length scales of nanometers. A nanometer is a unit of measure, just like inches, feet, or miles. It is a one billionth of a meter and used to measure things that are extremely small, like atoms or molecules. In a lot of my research, I utilize X-ray microscopes that instead of visible light, use X-rays to probe materials. I carry out this research at the Advanced Photon Source and the Center for Nanoscale Materials at Argonne National Laboratory. The Advanced Photon Source is one of the most technologically complex machines in the world. This premier national research facility provides ultra-bright, high-energy X-ray beams to more than 5,000 scientists from across the United States. 
these scientists bring with them ideas for new discoveries in nearly every scientific discipline, from material science to biology, chemistry, environmental, geological, and planetary science, and fundamental physics. The knowledge the scientists gain promises to have real and positive impact on our technologies, our health, our economy, and our fundamental understanding of the materials that make up our world. I used to live and operate in this vivid science domain that, for me, was not connected to art yet. But this all changed, all in a sudden, during one experiment in 2010. Like many good stories that you would see in books or movies, it started with a love story. One night, I was carrying out an experiment with a PhD student by the name Gerald. Our goal was to explore magnetic interactions in emerging materials that might one day lead to new ways of data storage. Since measurements take some time, Gerald and I were in a very engaged conversation in which he at some point mentioned that he had recently met that beautiful French woman, Gwen. Now, the fact that Gerald and Gwen had fallen in love was certainly heartwarming, but it wouldn't have changed my life, to be honest. But what came next was one of these defining, transformative moments. Gerald continued and he explained that Gwen was a postdoctoral researcher at the Art Institute in Chicago, a place I had visited many times and enjoyed greatly. He continued telling me that Gwen and her supervisor, Francesca Casadio, worked on a new project. The goal of this ambitious project was to determine if Pablo Picasso had used a certain kind of house paint in some of his artwork. A question that art historians were intensely debating for many, many years. The team at the Art Institute had collected some spectroscopic data but they couldn't quite get conclusive information from them. Now, that night, in this defining moment, I understood that my scientific expertise, unexpectedly, could have a significant impact in the art world. I immediately realized that I have all the tools and techniques at my disposal to potentially answer the Picasso question. So the next day, I was able to utilize the bond between Gran and Gerald to contact Francesca Casadio and start a journey of investigating Picasso's artwork with nanoscale X-ray microscopy. The art historians have long believed that Pablo Picasso was one of the first artists using colors made for painting houses rather than the more expensive oils favored by his contemporaries. However, despite some existing clues to the artist's preference, including a few photographs showing Picasso with tints of house paint, scholars judged that the evidence was inconclusive. To start our exploration, we had to first collect reference samples of house paint commonly used in France at Picasso's time. How did we get them? We used the French version of eBay. Then, by analyzing the emission spectra of a tiny fleck of white color on a Picasso painting, and comparing those to the eBay samples, we showed that both shared the same chemical makeup. We had a match. 
This was the scientific proof that Picasso indeed used house paint in some of his artwork. Thanks to X-ray microscopy, we have demonstrated that the white paint in Picasso still alive with three fishes, moray eel and lime on white ground, came from an enamel house paint known under the name Ripoli. Science had solved an art dispute. Since this initial work, I was able to apply our X-ray techniques to study other works of art and cultural heritage objects. For example, together with colleagues from the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., we have analyzed old photographs, so-called daguerreotypes, and I brought one with me. Daguerreotypes was the first commercially successful photographic process in history of photography. Each daguerreotype is a unique image usually formed on a highly polished silver surface on a copper substrate. The goal of our investigation was to find out the chemistry and underlying processes that can lead to corrosion and degradation of such daguerreotypes, and to look for methods to stop or reverse engineer the process. In my view, preserving daguerreotypes is an important undertaking because they have significantly changed our society. Many daguerreotypes were taken in the era of the Civil War. For the first time in human history, they showed the brutal face of conflict and war, very different from the heroic paintings that before had depicted mostly the glory of victory and the strength and bravery of warriors. Daguerreotypes captured the grim and gruesome realities of armed warfare. Therefore, we have to preserve these unique and valuable artifacts for future generations. Our microscopy study on the daguerreotype has helped to visualize, in this case, sulfur corrosion with nanoscale resolution, opening up the path to new ways of daguerreotype conservation. I mentioned daguerreotypes. I showed you Picasso paint. These are just two examples of how science informs art. But can art also inform science? It turns out yes. Today, Across the country, teachers are pioneering new approaches of combining art and STEM disciplines, which have been isolated from one another in a traditional curriculum. STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. For instance, some schools teach geometry through the lens of art. Math and art students come to understand that scale and geometry is the same concept as perspective in art. I myself have been fortunate enough to be able to extend my fascination for art and science toward the education of high school students. For the last three years, it has been my distinct pleasure to carry out scientific investigations of art and cultural heritage artifacts together with groups of students from local high schools. In a recent project with a group of students from Naperville Central High School in Illinois, we have studied the chemical makeup of iron gull ink. And we did this in a historic document from 1861. Iron gull ink was the standard writing ink from the 5th to the 19th century. It was made from iron salts and tannic acids from vegetable sources. One of the known problems of iron gull ink is the degradation of cellulose in historic paper. Since iron gull ink is usually acidic, it can easily promote 
paper corrosion, where the ink breaks apart, subsequently destroying the paper. Using our powerful X-ray microscope at the advanced photon source, the students have revealed the chemical composition of historic ink at the nanoscale. In an extension of this project, together with a different high school group and a very driven science teacher, we were then able to reverse engineer historic gull ink. Here the students explored how variations in ingredients and changes in the ink recipe impact the chemistry and characteristics of the ink. Currently, a new school project is ongoing in which we conduct an X-ray analysis of an Egyptian cadenage. Cadenage is the material used in ancient Egyptian funerary masks. The goal of our study here is to elucidate the composition of the pigments used in the mummy's cadenage and draw inferences about its creator's way of life. These are just a couple of examples about how I am able today to connect science and art. I have to add that these projects have also deeply affected my sense and perception of community and my personal role in it. After working together with world-renowned art institutions, I now also experience much pleasure in working with high school students at the intersection of art and science. Helping young people to attain a more holistic view is very beneficial. Actually, the way we promote an innovative next generation is to make sure we have a creative and critical force of thinkers coming through our school. At the same time, I try to encourage students to always stay open-minded and look out for the mysteries in the world. So far, this has been an amazing journey for me. At the beginning was a love story between Gerald and Gwen. What started as a random small talk during that night, during an experiment in 2010, has changed my perspective and opened up new horizons in my professional and personal life. I was able to abandon my previously perceived divide between arts and science, and I find huge, huge enrichment in the crossovers. I would like to invite you to also engage our world through a more holistic approach. Please wear both the scientist's and the artist's glasses. As a matter of fact, I strongly believe that everybody following my talk is an artist and a scientist. Because you are human. The degree to which we can execute a brush stroke or solve a math equation may vary. But as humans, we are all trying to find the answers to the big questions. What is true? What does it mean? And how can we move our lives and society forward? Please engage in science and art to find the answers. Thank you very much. <laughs>